What we're going to be talking about this morning is the, uh, the, the importance of inflammation in neurologic disease. We will start with that. We will then morph that in, or segue that into the role, the relationship between inflammation in the brain and how that relates to free radical production. Therefore, the importance of antioxidants, the peer review literature substantiating how important antioxidants are in neurodegenerative conditions. And then, uh, time permitting, we're actually going to look at a topic called neuro de- neuroregeneration or neurogen- neuronogenesis, where we now understand <clears throat> that you can actually regrow brain cells, which I think is really kind of exciting. What is, is in, you know, my brief experience with this group has been just from this morning, and I know exactly where you're coming from, because the type of work that I do is also considered fringe, yet scientifically supported. All of the statements that I make are supported by the most well-regarded peer review research, and yet for some reason do not enter the, the mainstream uh, parlance of treating neurologic disease. And I think it's, uh, you know, we've really come to a crossroads where uh, we see the profound influence of uh, mainstream pharmaceuticals in uh, affecting the way medicine is practiced. So from my perspective, I'm kind of on the, op- the other side, but we're really on the same side here. And, you know, um, every day patients are coming to see me wanting whatever drug they happen to see on the evening news the night before, whether it's a purple pill or a paisley pill, thinking that this is really their salvation. But the fundamental principle I'd like to look at today is that we've got to emphasize prevention in terms of brain disease, and nobody wants to talk about that. You know, John Kennedy said that the time to fix the, the roof is when the sun is shining. But for some reason, in the neurologic conditions, nobody pays attention to prevention. Well, let's look at some of the <clears throat> data that supports the fact that inflammation is really at the cornerstone of uh, degeneration of the brain. And this goes back to May of 2004. They, in this study published in the archives, Archives of Neurology is put out by the American Medical Association. They called our attention to the fact that these inflammation markers, IL-6, C-reactive protein, are associated with a significant increased risk of dementia. And what does that mean? Well, in in this study, they actually looked at C-reactive protein, an inflammatory marker, and found that going ahead 25 years, they measured this marker 25 years ago and then evaluated men and found that there's a threefold increased risk for all dementias, including Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, in those people who 25 years ago had an elevated C-reactive protein, calling our attention to the fact that inflammation plays a fundamental role in uh, neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, I noticed here that Great Smokies Diagnostic Lab is here. And they're actually putting together a brain panel that contains things like C-reactive protein, uh, homocysteine that we'll talk about, urinary lipid peroxide study measuring antioxidant function. But here, look at the risk for vascular dementia based upon C-reactive protein, a 500% increased risk if you happen to have a high CRP. So from the clinician's perspective, we should be checking CRP in every one of our patients because it's a very important marker for risk for developing a neurologic condition. So there are actually symposia held, this one now five years ago, looking at the role of inflammation in Alzheimer's, for example. Well, why is inflammation, uh, what's the data that supports it? We know that the brains of Alzheimer's patients are are much increased in measuring, when you measure these inflammatory cytokines, the reactive microglia, the brain's macrophage system, which uh, is the brain's, uh, plays a critical role in in, uh, brain immunity, is upregulated dramatically in the Alzheimer's patient. The complement pathway is activated in their brains, and we know that anti-inflammatory drugs have an important role to play retrospectively in epidemiologic studies in terms of reducing risk. Uh, you can actually look at these microglia. You can image them. And uh, that's the, p- the panel on the right side. You can look at the MRI and notice there's a lot of atrophy. There's a lot of the valleys between the mountains are uh, enlarged. But when you look at the microglia on the right side, you see that they are, they're active. They're turned on. And that's a kind of a you know, very good description of what the brain looks like uh, when the brain is on fire. So beyond Alzheimer's disease, is inflammation playing a role in Parkinson's disease? And you bet it is. Um, new research shows that those individuals whose uh, uh, mouses don't work, who, who have been on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, this was, uh, came out in um, August of 2003, 
looked, found a 45% reduction in the risk of becoming Parkinsonian if you happen to have been using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or aspirin. Now, what I'm going to develop this morning is a theme that is non-drug based, that is more nutrition based in terms of how we regulate the immune system in patients. But <clears throat> what is it, taking a step back, that increases inflammation in the brain and really in the body? Because inflammation is really quite fundamental to coronary artery disease. C-reactive protein relates to coronary artery disease, as you all know, also to cancer and also to, to diabetes. And there are various events and predispositions that people have. They can be genetically predisposed, uh, head trauma, infectious agents, uh, like chlamydia pneumonia, for example, which now is pretty well understood to be a, a significant cause of coronary artery disease, probably plays a role in, in the inflammation of the brain uh, in the uh, multiple sclerosis patient, uh, as seen uh, at several university studies, including Vanderbilt, where they found evidence of chlamydia pneumonia in 100% of the spinal fluid evaluations they did on their MS patients. Well, what's the down, what is inflammation? Why is it so bad? Because inflammation in, turns on these reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species, but actually goes even further than that, and I'll go through the mechanism. It actually turns on the genes to create things like nitric oxide and create and turn on COX-2 enzyme. We know what COX-2 enzyme plays a critical role in the inflammatory pathway, increasing the production of prostaglandin 2 series, which mediate this inflammation. So this is the relationship then between inflammation and, the, and free radical production. As we age, the level of reactive oxygen species, or free radicals, as you will, uh, increases, probably for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is the progressive failure of our own antioxidant system. And in fact, you know, this is kind of a fundamental hallmark of aging. But it's interesting to note that if you plot out the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, those mediators of uh, inflammation, you see that, in fact, uh, that curve uh, predates the reactive oxygen species. So the inflammatory cytokines actually happens first. But what's most important is this turning on of the genes, this turning on of uh, the unraveling of the, the DNA producing messenger RNA for what are called these toxic gene products. You know, when I went to medical school, DNA was locked in a glass case, and everything that happened to you uh, was pretty much dictated by that DNA. It was a one-way experience. DNA had the entire print, blueprint for your um, physiology, and that would express itself during your lifetime. We now know that DNA is that your genes are, in fact, very active moment to moment, uh, that your genes are expressing differently every moment of your life based upon the foods that you eat, the drugs that you may be taking, and even the emotional experiences that you're having. Just listening to this lecture is changing your genetic expression every second in, in terms of thousands of genes, just the way somebody says something to you. Like, for example, if somebody says, oh, what's that in the road ahead? that has a different effect upon you uh, as opposed to if they said, what's that in, in the road, a head? <laughs> so we need to think about when we look at our patients, um, what's going on as we change, uh, as they progressively decline uh, over years, that actually what's happening is their genes have been modified. Genetic expression changes, and that's what happens in, the, for example, this Parkinsonian uh, patient over just a, a couple, uh, three years uh, from this original uh, lithograph. So this is what we're trying to prevent. Let's understand, you know, when I lecture to Parkinson's groups and I say, how many people here are taking medicines to treat your Parkinson's? And all the hands go up, you know, with the Stalevo and the Mirapex and the Requip and the Cinemat and the Symmetrel and on and on. And I say, you know, as a matter of fact, Probably none of you is taking anything to treat your Parkinson's disease, and they're all, they, well, they actually don't look very surprised because they have no facial expression. It's, it's a hard group to work, I want to tell you. You know, you tell your best joke to a group of Parkinson's, and you're waiting, and then you realize, you know. I think the harder group would be um, if you lecture, uh, you make comments to a group of uh, obsessive compulsives, because after your lecture, then you start getting letters, and they never stop. You just <laughs> keep getting letters. <laughs> 